Okay. Give folks one more minute. I mean, who starts right at seven, really? All right, we're live. For the folks who are joining on YouTube, we are just giving our Zoom registrants a couple extra moments to join and then we'll get going. Thanks so much to everyone who came already on time. Beautiful Thursday, end of summer, beginning of fall. Okay. All right, yeah, I think we'll stay on speaker view just so that we can make sure as the discussion jumps around, the person who's actively speaking will be spotlit. Okay. All right, I'll get us going. Um, my name is Heather Kelly. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Seattle King County. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you and our panelists tonight um, to a wonderful discussion about the Office of the Prosecutor and the impact of the choices made by that elected official. Um, as many of you know, we have an upcoming um, vote ahead of us uh, to hire a new King County prosecutor into office um, as constituents. So um, this conversation is intended to educate and inform voters around that choice and kind of the, the bigger picture too. Um, before we get going, I would just like to pause and acknowledge that we are on the traditional unceded land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish, Coast Salish people past and present, and we honor them with gratitude um, and the land itself. Um, and at the League, we also um, are practicing another type of acknowledgement called a labor acknowledgement. Um, so I'd like to take a moment for that as well. Um, we pay homage to those stolen from Africa, placed in shadow bondage, forced into labor and called slaves, to those who lost their lives blasting through mountains to build the transcontinental railroad and build this country. We honor the individuals whose forced, unpaid, underpaid, and exploited labor built and is building much of the Americas to our indigenous, African, Asian, and Hispanic forebears. We commit to the continued struggle for reparations, labor protection, due process, and equal access. Um, I'm gonna be putting um, an action item in the chat just to ground those acknowledgements in um, a real um, a real step with real world consequence for impacted populations. Um, and Sonatina, if I could ask you to put um, the link to real real rent um, in chat, that would be great. Uh, this is a way of literally paying for our occupation of um, unceded land. So um, thank you so much to our co-sponsors, the Federal Way Black Collective, the Northwest Community Bail Fund, and the Puget Sound Passport Rotary Club um, for partnering with the League on this awesome event. I'm really excited for this discussion. I'm really excited to be drawing an audience um, of supporters of all those organizations in the same room. Um, that's something we've really been trying to do more of. Um, and a couple of housekeeping matters for those of you who are just joining, welcome. Um, if you need assistance hearing uh, the speakers tonight, go ahead and um, scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on the option for live transcript. That'll bring up a little menu and you can hit show subtitle for closed captioning. Um, if there are other accommodations that you need tonight, you can go ahead and um, put those in chat and we'll do our best to accommodate those. Uh, we're also live streaming on YouTube, so, and the recording will be available afterwards. Um, let's see. So a couple guidelines uh, for using chat tonight. 
Um, this is a voter education event. It's not um, an opportunity for candidates to um, campaign or for, um, for folks to express their support or opposition to particular candidates. So please keep that out of the chat. Um, we want you to discuss this concept. We want you to engage with each other and the panelists, um, but just keep it respectful. Uh, disrespectful comments will be deleted. If you have a question, the chat is the place to go. Um, it will really help us pull out the questions from the rest of the discussion going on if you write in all caps questions. Um, we have some of you tracking those in a separate document. Um, and you know, if the panelists are using words or phrases or concepts that you don't understand, pop that question right in chat. If we can't get to it during the panel, um, we will be following up with folks to the best of our ability afterwards, because um, the whole point is to get your questions answered. Okay, and now I've been talking for a minute, but I still got to introduce our awesome moderator, Felicia Hudson. Uh, she's an advocate for justice and equality for the people. She began her work in advocacy at Highline Community College, where she obtained her paralegal degree and served as the Student Legislative Action Committee Chair. She interned at a criminal defense law firm in Federal Way. As the FWBC program coordinator, Felicia Hudson uses her skills in advocacy and passion for people to serve through the various programs that the Federal Way Black Collective offers to the community. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Felicia. Thank you so much for moderating tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I greatly appreciate you inviting me and this time. Um, and thank you everybody uh, for joining us tonight. We have a lot of great conversation that we're about to have. So um, I first would like for our panel, before we get started, have our panel introduce themselves. Um, so I guess let's start with um, Mr. Satterberg. Would you like to go ahead and interest introduce yourself and tell us about you? Well, thank you very much. And thanks for having me. And I appreciate this forum. And at the end of the night, I hope that everybody who spent some time watching this understands why it's important to put the prosecuting attorney's office uh, under their scrutiny. It's an office that deserves attention. And I've been there for 37 years and I've got three, three months and 21 days left uh, and I will be retiring at the end of this year. So I know an awful lot about the office, probably more than people really want to know. Uh, um, but it has been uh, really what I've done and, and since 1984. I was in law school. I was an intern uh, at the juvenile division. So many things have changed in 37 years, uh, not the least of which is what does the community want and expect from their prosecutor's office. So I hope we can touch on a lot of those issues, but I'm Seattle uh, born and raised, UW double dog, uh, and went right out of law school into the prosecutor's office. And I'm looking forward to retiring on midnight of uh, December 31st. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and next we have, um, let's see, our next panelist. Would you like to introduce yourself? I guess we're gonna go from left to right. So Sean, <laughs> would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Felicia. I wasn't sure if it was the same on your screen as it is on mine. I want to offer a brief correction for Dan Satterberg. He's uh, South King County uh, born and raised. That's significant. Um, there's uh, way too often there's a, a large representation from the city of Seattle that doesn't quite encompass the many diverse and unique needs of the folks in South King County. And as a fellow Highline School District alum, I want to make sure we we uh, we bring that to center as well. Uh, my name is Sean Good. I steward an organization in our community, uh, Choose 180 is our executive director. I, it's important for this night in particular that I give a special shout out to my wife um, as we are on vacation celebrating our 11th wedding anniversary um, and, and on the East Coast. And I committed to doing this because this conversation is very important. It's one that I believe for the future of our county, we need to center with a sense of urgency. And so I wanted to make sure that I could be present and um, she co-signed on me being in our hotel room at 10 o'clock in the evening, talking at a volume that's probably not as appropriate as it should be, an effort to be able to share space with all of you. Um, and that's why I often tell people as often as I'm able that I'm married to the most amazing woman in the world. And I'm the father of two incredible children. Uh, my daughter, Hope, who is a high school sophomore, and my son, Samuel, who is a college junior. Um, and I've been serving in this capacity at uh, Choose 180 for the past six years and have been deeply vested in transformative justice for the past 20 years. 
Um, and when Dan uh, first joined the prosecutor's office back in 1984, I was three. Um, and uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll I'll pass to whoever may be next. All right. Um, next, we have Chanel. Hello, Chanel. Hello. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chanel Rhymes. I am the Director of Advocacy for the Northwest Community Bail Fund. Um, we help people um, by posting uh, bail uh, for during pretrial detention. Um, I grew up in the Tacoma area. I am formerly incarcerated. I've been doing this work, uh, criminal punishment reform for over a decade now, and um, I'm really excited to be here and to um, hopefully educate folks on what's actually happening within this system and the role that prosecutors actually play out uh, on folks' lives. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have uh, Anita as well. Anita, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Anita Kandel. I am the um, director of the Department of Public Defense for King County. So we represent um, people who are charged with crimes or facing the loss of their children um, or other kinds of loss of liberty um, in King County courts um, and who are, uh, who are poor, who qualify for our services. Um, uh, I consider our work to be deeply racial justice work because our, our the system is deeply racially disproportionate and we represent uh, a significant number of our clients, um, our BIPOC, and um, I'm grateful to be part of this conversation. So thank you so much for inviting me. Awesome, awesome. All right, so um, we will get started with our questions. Uh, so. Um, Let's see. So the purpose really, we kind of went over this, but kind of to review it again, the purpose of tonight's forum is to educate the community members um, about the role of the prosecutor and our criminal legal system. Um, most people really don't realize how important it is, and we keep saying that, but it's so true. Um, there is a lot of power in that position. And so we just want to um, bring light to that and then also, you know, educate everybody. So um, we'll hop right to, uh, let's see, we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Satterberg. Can you briefly explain what the King County Prosecutor's Office does uh, with an emphasis on the criminal division? Certainly, and, and let me just start with sort of the, the data. It's a, we are the second largest public law office in the state of Washington, next to the Attorney General's office, uh, about 575 employees. We have a significant role as corporate counsel for King County. So we have a civil division, about 60, 65 attorneys and uh, another 30 plus staff who handle all of the advice and litigation involving the civil function. So that everything that goes through the county executive or the county council. We have a, a family support division that uh, sets child support and enforces child support orders. We have a juvenile division that uh, handles all of the cases uh, for youth under the age of 18 and the largest, and as you said, the criminal division. Uh, and it's split up into a number of different units depending on the kind of the subject matter. We have a presence down at the Mailing Regional Justice Center in Kent and also uh, up, up in uh, the King County Courthouse. So we will we'll talk a lot of you know, theoretical and institutional and policy stuff, but the number one thing that the elected prosecuting attorney has to do is run a major public law office. Uh, and that includes budget and includes all of the policy things you have to do, includes hiring uh, and you know, being a good place to work and to train people and, and to do all that. So number one, we are a large public law office. And, and then, of course, we play a major role. Uh, we have prosecutorial discretion, and I'll talk about that later on, I hope, because that is kind of the, the linchpin of, of what, how prosecutors exercise their power. Uh, it's the ability to decide what case to file and what case not to file, both individual cases and categorical cases. And the prosecutor can decide those things. As, and, and the authority for prosecutorial discretion is derived because it is a separately elected uh, position, an executive branch agency with finite resources. So the prosecutor has to decide where she wants to put her emphasis. She can't do everything. So the prosecutorial discretion allows you to decide what to do and what not to do. And the cool thing about it, and I tell all brand new prosecutors, it's your superpower because nobody can make you prosecute a case that you don't want to prosecute. 
So that's more of the of the ability uh, within the, the criminal division. But we have jurisdiction over all felony crimes in the state of in, in the county, King County, uh, and all juvenile crimes in King County, and all misdemeanors that happen outside of uh, incorporated cities. So and on the freeways, so the misdemeanors there. So we have a you know, very active practice. File about seven thousand felony cases a year, and um, more eight to ten thousand uh, misdemeanors as well. So. Uh, it's a real busy place. It's a it's a job where you have to make decisions. You're not always they're not always popular. One thing that I have learned is that whatever decision I make, somebody's not going to like it. Uh, and so it's just it's a, it's a job where you still have to lean in and make decisions uh, and do the right thing. And that's the best part of this law job is that you get to do the right thing for the right reasons. Uh, and my client is to serve justice. And that may look you know that that'll look different every day. Uh, which is why it's yeah, a fantastic fine. job. But thank you. So specifically the criminal division, um, then you guys overall, right, try cases um, and and bring them forward, right, the charges. So we receive the, the uh, case from the police department. And if it's a rush case, if it's a serious violent case, we have 72 hours to file that case. Uh, and, then, uh, and then eventually that case will be negotiated um, and worked up and either result in a plea or a dismissal or a trial. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and um, go to our next question. Um, and that's for Anita. Uh, can you kind of walk us through the timeline of a typical criminal case um, from like arrest to sentencing? Um, that's pretty challenging because there's not sort of a typical um, case. Um, but I can tell you that uh, so generally the way the system works is that someone will get um, booked into jail um, by an officer and then they'll have a, an initial hearing what's called a preliminary appearance um, where a court decides if there's probable cause to hold the person and will make a decision regarding bail or not and that gives a prosecuting attorney's office um, a couple of days to make a decision about whether they actually want to file charges um, and that that decision to release someone or not is a really really important one um, but before I get there, um, then the next step is if if uh, if Dan's office files charges, then the person has an arraignment hearing at which they're informed of the charges and they enter a plea, generally not guilty. Um, and then um, uh, we have another opportunity to argue for release. Um, and pretrial detention is a is a a huge determiner of what the outcome of a case is. And so there are lots of studies that say that show that people who are held in jail during their case are more likely to plea and are more likely to have long sentences. Um, it's why the work that Chanel, the Northwest Bail Fund, do is so important, right? They're trying to level that playing field a tiny bit because once you have someone in jail, if you give them an, a plea offer of credit for time served, right? Like you know, it's taken a few months for the court to hear your case, for the police report to get to your attorney, for you to talk to your attorney and the prosecutor's offering to just let you plead out and you can walk out the door if you plead. Whereas if you want to go to trial, you might have to wait a few months because the courts are backed up. It's going to take time. It's going to take time to get the witnesses. Um, you know, I, we have many, many clients who Right, their first priority is to get out of jail. They have families to get to, they have jobs to get to, they have community to get to, they have loved ones they need to get to. And so they end up taking that credit for time served plea in order to walk out that, that door. Um, getting to trial generally takes much, much longer, um, especially on sort of a more serious case with a lot of witnesses, just getting all the investigation done, making sure it, on both sides for a defense attorney to make sure that they're doing a good job. Um, of really investigating every part of the case for the prosecutor to get their witnesses ready, um, to get enough jurors to a courtroom. All these things take a lot of time. Um, and so it's really hard for me to say, here's a typical case and here's what, what happens. I mean, most cases um, in the criminal punishment system are resolved by a plea. Um, the, you know, this just, I think it's about 95% or so um, nationally, and I don't think King County is radically different. Um, so very few cases go to trial. But again, I do think this, this factor of pretrial detention plays a big role in that, because if you are in, you are just much more likely to plea, you're more likely to, to get convicted and to get those long sentences and lots of research backs that up. Um, but I um, I think I'm going to stop there just because I I, I feel that um, it's very mm -hmm. likely that Chanel and, uh, and, and Sean have a lot to add to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and yes, I would actually like to hear um, 
kind of the answer to um, the next question, at what points uh, during that process does the prosecutor have the opportunity to exercise discretion? And I'm gonna throw that question um, to Chanel. At what point does the prosecutor have to discretion? I mean, from the initial um, time that the case is presented to them or the charges are presented to them, um, they can choose to prosecute somebody or not. What I think they should be taking into discretion is the impact that it's going to have on the community, folks, families immediately. Um, a lot of times, you know, because the people that are arresting folks do not have law degrees and don't fully understand criminal law all the way, they may not hit certain elements of a crime. And so that's going to take investigation. A lot of times an attorney can or a prosecutor can see that off the bat just from reading the police report. So they can, you know, go ahead and not charge, but it seems as though they still charge anyway and see if they'll be able to just get somebody to plead out. Okay. And then um, over to you, Sean, same question. Yeah, I, I, I would like to, uh, I'll answer that. I'd like to back it up a little bit too, that I think that um, the process of someone getting engaged in the criminal legal system begins before they're contacted by police. Um, it starts when they wake up in the morning, um, the environment that they wake up in, the socioeconomic condition that they're living in, their access to mental health, um, their access to adequate treatment for addiction that they may or may not be navigating, um, whether or not they're resourced in a way that they're able to be housed, um, the stability of their housing, the proximity to quality education, um, to quality health care, um, access to healthy foods. There are so many social determinants that dictate whether or not a person, as they wake up in the morning, is likely to be contacted by law enforcement and to have their behavior criminalized. Um, that's where this thing begins. And so if we, we really need to ground our understanding that um, so much of what is dictated and deemed to be criminal behavior has a lot to do with when and where and what conditions a person wakes up with, with in the morning. Um, and many of those things are beyond their control. So, and, and we know that because if we look at like Seattle Municipal Court and the sheer percentage of people who are eligible for a public defender that our region at large criminalizes at a dramatic rate uh, poverty and people who are living in poverty and suffering the many disparate outcomes that living in poverty in a community where it costs you know at over a million dollars to be a homeowner right um and so i think it's really important that we we ground ourselves in that truth as we consider what this what this process looks like of criminalizing behavior um folks being in, getting in contact with the prosecutor a prosecutor using their discretion to then advance that criminalization to the courts and then the courts adjudicating a case like at a vast majority of time by virtue of a plea deal, um, which is why it's helpful to have stop gaps put into place like diversion programs. Um, I wanna be clear as I speak to this, that all of these diversion programs are stop gaps. They only exist because harm exists. Um, they should not be necessary. Um, they are in place because we know that people who are most, who are farthest away from justice are likely to be criminalized. And so we need to have stop gaps put in place to decriminalize that behavior and offer people what they need, which is community and support from community instead of a courtroom and a conviction that will only exacerbate the condition that led them to being present in front of a prosecutor, a police officer, or a judge in the first place. Um, and so that's where work like ours comes into place, where we partner with um, system entities like prosecutors, superintendents, uh, uh, police chiefs to co-create solutions that live outside of those systems of harm and live in community. So that way people have access to those systems in community that then create an off ramp from a historically harmful system that disproportionately impacts those that are farthest away from justice, those who have been farthest away from justice for well over 400 years in this country. Um, and, and I think that we need to, as a community, begin to lean into more of those practices as long as we're still having the, 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 the propensity to criminalize behavior that could otherwise be dealt with in ways that are far beyond the bounds of courtrooms, prosecution, and police stations. That was a lot of information. That was an excellent answer um, and a lot of topics were covered. Um, I'm sure people will have a lot of questions uh, to follow up with that. Um, so kind of going 
to charging, which I believe you touched on, uh, Sean. Um, but I'm going to kind of pop on over to Dan with this question. Um, so when a prosecutor is deciding whether to decline or divert a case, uh, rather than pursue a traditional prosecution, what factors uh, are or should be considered? Um, are there basic standards for prosecutors to follow, I guess, in making these decisions? That's a great question. And, you know, trying to be consistent along along an entire large office with 180 people in our criminal division and have them all arrive at the same decision requires filing standards that are published, that are taught, that are available to everybody, defense and prosecutor and the public can see our filing standards. So those are to help guide us into what we call a conservative filing uh, policy where we file the, the initial charge that we think uh, most accurately reflects the, the, uh, the conduct of the person. Um, the decision about diversion is uh, for many, many years, we wanted to divert and it was all with the question was, well, divert to what? We didn't have things to divert them to other than the traditional court diversion program in the juvenile court. And so over the last 10 years, um, that has changed. That's really one of the great things that has changed that the community has stepped up and said, let us build. And now the county is funding to a significant degree. Let us build these alternatives, we'll build the instead. So instead of filing this case in court, send it to us. And we can try to accomplish the things that Sean's talking about where community shows up for an individual. The cool thing about our, our diversion programs now, we have one in juvenile court called Restorative Community Pathways. We have one that's about to launch an adult court is that we also offer the same kind of help to the person who was harmed. So if the person has, is, has lost some money, maybe they have their cell phone to stolen, uh, we, we can make public restitution as part of this program. So restitution amounts used to disqualify people from being diverted. Now it's part of the whole program. And because the demographics of crime victims are so often close to the demographics of the person who caused the harm, that we, we ask, you know, we provide the same sort of offer. What can we do to help? you with the resources that we have. So the diversion programs now, instead of saying divert to what, now I now we say compared to what? Compared to the courtroom and particularly, and we, we need we can't leave the night without talking about what COVID has done to our our court system and the court systems around the country. But uh, you know rather than put that case into court, there's so many good cases that could in that more urgently get addressed in the community. Uh, and so that's where uh, the county has funded a number of different agencies to step up and we are referring individuals who could be charged into those programs instead. And that is an exercise of prosecutorial discretion. And if they qualify under our written standards, then we send them there. We'll offer assistance to the harm party, but the harm party does not veto whether or not the individual gets to go into that diversion program. So just getting off the ground, I'll, I'll enjoy watching it grow as a private citizen, but I'm proud that the community has stepped up and said, let us help you. Let us help build that more effective, more personal uh, and, and cheaper uh, and less stigmatizing and doing less harm kind of approach. So the diversion programs that are out there are terrific and we need to keep growing them. Yes, uh, Sean, would you like to go ahead and speak to this? Yeah, I, I just want to add, and, and thanks, you know, I, the history of Choose 180 is a, is a unique one for our region because we began in partnership with Dan and the office back in 2011 when, uh, when Dan reached out to a community leader, Doug Wheeler, acknowledging that the office was failing black and brown children and had to come up with another way of being to see more successful outcomes. Um, and Doug at that moment was more than willing to lean in and co-create that with the prosecutor's office and, and eventually our organization now lives, um, you know, outside of that space and is, is no longer dependent on the funding of the prosecutor's office to thrive and serve young people and community like we were in our infancy. And I wanted to bring that up because so often um, like the, the narrative is that the community has stepped up. Um, and it's because the community has stepped up that um, we're able to do these things. And I want to make sure that our audience understands that it was because the prosecutor's office was willing to acquiesce some of their power and effort for the community to, to stand where it had been standing historically, which is in the gap for young people who are from their community who desperately needed alternatives. And it wasn't until the prosecutor's office who holds the power and, and, and controls the power was willing to acquiesce that power that work like ours was able to begin. 
Um, community has always been here, always been present, always waiting and willing and advocating to step up and find new and more assertive ways to support young people and adults who given the opportunity to thrive outside of the confines of the criminal legal system would be more than willing to do so. What it requires is the type of uh, prosecutor because of the way the law is set up that would lean in and say, absolutely, instead of um, instead of using our discretion to charge and advance things to the court and put people through a system that only exacerbates the harm, we'll get them access to community and the type of supports that allow people to thrive outside of those historically harmful constructs. Um, that, that, that's, that's the significance of this office and why this particular election carries the weight that it does. And although it's often one of those kind of down ballot bubbles that people make in, 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 in their routine process of completing their, their, their voting uh, responsibility, um, it's imperative that the voting public in Martin Luther King Jr. County understand that we are putting not just somebody in a position to steward a very complicated um, space with a diversity of opinions and perspectives, but somebody in place, if they leverage their discretion inappropriately, can roll back decades of work that's been done in effort to have the community claim what's rightfully theirs the opportunity to amplify our community members as possible instead of problematic and use the resources that have historically been relegated to put people behind bars to give them what they truly need, an opportunity to engage in a healing journey, those who have been impacted and those who have been accused of cause, causing impact. Because what we know is people who are healing become more authentically who they've always been created to be. And none of us were born out the womb um, with the intent to cause harm. All of us were born with a purpose that's greater than that. That is a great answer. Um, I love the fact that you just mentioned, you know, about people being born, um, you know, just good people. Um, so I'm going to bring um, this question also around to Chanel. Um, I saw that your hand was up. Um, so uh, would you like to answer the question or speak to it? I was just going to speak to, um, it's great that the prosecutor has decided to do create diversion programs. And um, Sean talked about how they can, you know, use that power in the good. On the flip side, the prosecutor also can use the power for not so good, which I tend to see on a daily in the work that I do. Um, we are helping folks access their constitutional right to bail. There are prosecutors that specifically have asked that we not be able to post folks bail. We have um, the prosecutor's office going on the news and saying that we are the reason why somebody was out and was able to uh, commit another crime. So in regards to public safety and you know creating other programs, are they aware that they are creating, not creating safe environments for other folks, such as people that work at the bail fund? Because those are other on the flip side. So it's like, it's great that they're doing, you know, these types of things. But I think people need to understand where prosecutors' offices can also abuse that power, which is essentially a lot of times what happens. And people can't advocate for themselves because they don't have the means. So, um, you know, I, I think it's it's one thing to say, like, it's great. He's doing this for youth. But at the same time, they're still going after their parents. So it's like, great, they're doing it for youth, but the parents, the adults are still getting taken in and arrested. And if anything, that is doing nothing but creating generational poverty, gener systemic, uh, systemic poverty. So, you know, when you're prosecuting somebody, keep in mind, you are, it's not just that person you're prosecuting, it's the whole family, it's the children, it's everybody else. And I don't think that's taken into consideration a lot of times. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, grateful to be here in this space, but as somebody that works dealing with the prosecutor's office on a daily, I'm just not going to sit here and act like they're just doing a whole bunch of great job because it's just, that's just not what's happening. And if anything, the prosecutor is putting my life in danger by going on TV and telling people that we are the reason that somebody else has committed a crime. Thank you, uh, Chanel. Um, so we're going to have to keep moving um, along as far as, um, questions goes. Um, so uh, I saw your hand, uh, Dan, and I will um, 
have you go ahead and speak to that here in just a second, right after uh, this question, which is um, how does racial bias, both personal and institutional, affect different stages of the criminal legal system? And what steps can be taken to identify and reduce racial biases in the screening, filing, and prosecution of cases? Yeah, and I saw you had your hand up. Would you like to answer this question as well? Well, I was I was going to address the bail issue, but sure. I mean, yes, of course. Um, you know, the the moving parts within the, any justice system, and uh, and I always have to stop and say, you know, when we talk about the criminal justice system, we make it sound like it's a huge monolithic thing. There are two thousand three hundred elected prosecutors and in uh, the country, 3,000 counties, we have federal prosecutors and city prosecutors. So just know that, that we're talking about really individual localized reactions and policies. And uh, each of those individual you know, jurisdictions can attempt to do different things. I know in several jurisdictions, they're using a new tool that uh, screens out the identification data in a police report so that the uh, deputy district attorney who's reviewing the case to think about bringing charges isn't uh, given the information about the race or what the police officer thought the race of that individual was. So there, there's some things underway to, to study whether you know, we can make uh, charging decisions more race neutral. And there's certainly a long way before we've come up with the uh, proper tool. But I think I think thoughtful people and know that there is going to be some uh, implicit bias and explicit bias uh, within the criminal justice system. And I just wanted to say on, on bail that um, you know, judges set bail, prosecutors ask for bail and defense can ask for something and judges decide and they're, they're guided by a court rule that has them consider the future dangerousness of that individual and the likelihood of whether or not that individual will come to court. And so when we're dealing with the cases that, that we're dealing with where a large amount of bail is sought, there's usually been someone who's been killed or shot, or there's been some, some violent act that we believe we have sufficient evidence to charge the, this individual with, and that we are concerned that if they are not held pretrial, that more harm could come to the community. Uh, now, who, who, who posts the bail is a matter of public record. And I, I haven't been on TV talking about the Northwest Bail Fund, but if someone asks uh, my office or the court who did it, I and mean, we'll, we'll tell them uh, the truth about that. But the, the last thing I'll say about bail reform, and it's easy to say we should eliminate cash bail, but we don't have any infrastructure to supervise people who are on pretrial release. Uh, and so right now, judges are often left with a really binary choice. Either they're in or you're out, and there's not a whole lot of of other, there's no work release anymore in King County. There's other things that we have not invested in in terms of uh, community corrections that are in any way uh, robust enough. And, and so the judges often are left with that with a tough decision. Somebody before them has been accused of a very violent act, and do I, as a judge, take a chance and just let them right back out, or should we should we let that that process play out? So it's a tough thing. We, I, I think that if you're going to get to um, bail reform, that you have to invest in some pre-trial infrastructure, some probation officers, somebody who can keep an eye on the individual and have them report so that we know that they will show up for court and that they're not involved in future violent acts. I, I, I just need to address, uh, Mr. Sauerberg, we understand that you are not specifically on TV saying that, but you do have a representative from your office, Casey McNathery or something like that, uh, May 23rd, Fox News went on TV and said we were the reason why this person was out and did that. That's also not the first reporter that has contacted us. So while you're not personally on the TV, you do have a representative who's representing your office that is on TV saying those things. So just, just to be, it, it needs to be known that y'all do do this. So it, is, it is public information. Will, it's not, it's we, not a secret, right? I, I understand it's public definitely... information, but what I'm saying is it's like you are giving folks the they didn't go look for it you're out there will, telling folks before anybody even asked you're you're giving up the information so yes it's totally public information but to go on television and then to specifically say that are two totally different things than somebody going to look it up on their own 
Well, and I, this, I it's would, not happening. I would within, love, it's not just one time, but I, I, I would, I'm not going to sit here and, <laughs> and act like this is, you know, it's like, oh, people are finding out on their own. No, yeah, y'all are yeah. doing that and telling folks okay. that. Right. And so let's, let's thank you uh, both for answering, you know, our questions. Um, and we can definitely have, you know, this conversation um, continue a little bit later. I want to make sure that we can get through our questions though. Um, so uh, let's see, Anita, I saw that you had your hand up. Um, I did, but I feel like so much has happened since I raised it that I, but let me, I let me can, offer a couple of quick comments. Uh, you know, first, you know, the question of bail and how much is being asked for, you know, if you, so the jail has a new, um, uh, a new data dashboard. And what that dashboard shows is that the majority of people, or if not the majority, about 40 to 50% of the people who are getting booked in are released after about three days. And so that means the prosecutor has asked for bail and the court has set bail. And then ultimately the prosecutor takes a couple of days to decide that um, this charge is not a priority for us right now. We'll file it some other time or we won't file it at all. In the interim, what's happened though, is that that person, those people who are spending those three days are experiencing complete destabilization of their lives, right? They're losing their jobs, they're losing their housing, they're losing connection to their family, and they are all people who are who are indigent. And, and I say this with experience because I do that preliminary appearance calendar um, generally once a month, sometimes more. And so I see who's on that calendar, and I can tell you that the, that the cases on the on that calendar occasionally are are ones that a prosecutor would consider serious, and very often are not ones that, uh, you know, there are property crimes. And I understand that people have a lot of concern about property crimes, but just as we talk about bail and when bail is being requested and for what purpose, I don't think anyone could legitimately believe that booking someone into jail for uh, for three days and then releasing them, destabilizing them is, is achieving any purpose other than both harming that individual and ultimately harming safety in our community because it's making that person even less stable. I can't tell you how many clients I've had who have said, please get me out today. I'm going to lose my job if I don't get out. Um, and when I present that information to the court, the prosecuting attorney's office always says, always asks for bail. Like there are zero cases when I do that calendar in which I see the prosecuting attorney's office say, we're gonna, we're gonna release, this, uh, the, release this person. Um, well, let me back off and say zero cases of late. In the past, particularly during the pandemic, I think I did see more of that. I did, I did many calendars during the pandemic. But recently, I'm really not seeing any agreement to release, always in position of bail. And what we're talking about, right, are poor people who are too poor to post. And if, you know, if Chanel and her organization happen to have the resources, they might get help. Otherwise, it's just the people who are too poor to, po to post bail who are sitting there for those three days. And again, the, the dashboard seems to indicate that 40 to 50% of people are getting out in about three days. Why are we putting them in in the first place? Could we not be doing something else with the resources to help them? To, right, to support them in our community. It is, like, I mean, it, it is insane for me to think about how many jail guards, public defenders, judges, prosecutors, how much taxpayer money we're throwing into jailing people, like without even any theory. Like, I mean, and of course, as a public defender, I would always say any incarceration is bad and doesn't serve the community. But even if you're someone who believes in incarceration as a thing that helps someone, you can't possibly think that three days in jail with no services particularly in a jail right now that has significant staffing issues where a lot of where there's not a lot of programming because you know we're still in the pandemic sort of environment that that's doing anything for anyone sorry i've said many many words and i see that my colleague has his hand up so i'm going to stop right there no that's great thank you so much um and Sean you got a comment yeah i just i wanted to add to the the choir of voices that are essentially saying what i think is abundantly clear um the notion that in keeping someone incarcerated for any period of time is somehow going to produce different outcomes than if they were released on without without bail is sort of like a misnomer right like we know that people who live incarcerated don't benefit more often than not from that incarceration in fact, all the data points tell us that the more engagement that an individual has with the court system, the more likely they are to re-engage the court system in the future. And so it's it's sort of obscene when the community at large um, leans into narratives that say, well, if someone's released on bail and they cause harm, it's because that they had access to bail that they caused harm. When, when they stay incarcerated, that causes harm that then leads to the potential of future harm 
and we don't critique the jail system or the other elements that Dan mentioned that are part of the criminal legal system that also exacerbate harm. I think it's also important that we, we talk about bail, that we talk about what a privilege issue bail is, because if someone does something egregious and has a bail amount that is exorbitant, but they have access to the resources to post bail for themselves, um, the judge isn't critiqued for that person posting a humongous bail because they have access to the resources necessary to do so. But if you incarcerate disproportionately people who are living in poverty, and then when you incarcerate people disproportionately who are living in poverty and you put bail as a restriction to them getting access to the resources they need to continue to stabilize, then what you're doing is causing disproportionate harm to those who are already furthest away from systems of justice. Um, and, and so like the, the, this, it's kind of a circular narrative. And, and what Dan said is true that like we need to have more resources available for folks outside of the court system. And that funnel of resources, as Dan knows, because we've had to move resources out of traditional criminalizing behavior into community, that that's that same bucket of dollars that we're pleading to have available so that way they can live in community and not have to live through a system of criminalization. I mean, just imagine for a moment if someone had access to healing before their behavior was criminalized through a judicial process that only increases the likelihood of them being harmed further and being more distant from healing, which then in turn would keep them farther away from causing harm in the future. Like it, there is a logical and rational way to do this. It requires a transference of resources and there's a limited amount of resources that, that are funneled through this traditional way of being. Um, and, which brings me back to the point that I, I was making initially and I wanna just hammer it home um, because of the, the, the context of this conversation, that's why who we elect as prosecutor matters so much in this region. It's because if we have people who are fixated on a law and order methodology and effort to be able to keep communities safe, we are going to walk back any progress that we've made over the past two decades in reimagining what justice can look like for those who have been furthest away. And Dan said it already, the people who are most often harmed are so similar in demographics to the people who are accused of causing harm. So if you want to do for those who, who have been impacted the most, you do for those by limiting the impact that it has on those that caused the impact while making sure those that have been impacted are made whole. Um, this is not complicated. The majority of the types of behaviors that are being adjudicated in this manner aren't the types of things that people wanna publicize and promote and put out there. We're not talking about like these horrifically imagined behaviors. We're talking about folks who given access to support where they live, giving the resources necessary to thrive where they live, access to mental health in a community that, that, that resources it as if it wasn't even a notion where they live, access to treatment where they live. We could turn this thing together collaboratively. That will require the type of people in office that can imagine outside of the confines of traditional prosecution and a community who's willing to get behind folks who are in those seats to not only partner and work with them, but hold them accountable with unapologetic truth to a journey towards justice that honors a collective us. Those who will always be and who have always been impacted by the criminal legal system, as well as those who have never had to contact 911 at all. Wow, that, that is a lot. And that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, so as I'm gonna point it to Chanel, uh, let's see. So can you discuss the impact on a defendant who is unable to make bail? Um, I mean, the impact could be, the most major impact, it could be their life. We still have COVID outbreaks in jail. People are dying in there. Um, they, they could lose their life for sitting in jail. Um, not, I mean, it could go all the way as somebody could lose custody of their children. They could lose their job. They could lose their housing. They could lose, um, you know, they can lose their mental health. It is not a nice place to be. A lot of people do not understand it as a, it is a disgusting, dirty place. I've been there. Uh, and a lot of people who are always touting to, for people to go, have never been there and experienced that. Um, it, it, it's a long lasting ripple effect. It can affect their children. Their children are harmed. Um, their children may not go to be able to go to school. I mean, just all of those things, you know, it just snowballs. 
And for us to think that the only way to make sure we have safety is bail, that's really not the case. Money does not equal supervision. That, that, that's not, that doesn't make it so that if somebody posts bail, then, you know, they're going to be, a, they're not going to be a risk. At the same time, we have bail bond agencies that make millions of dollars every day posting people's bail. Nobody says anything about those folks, um, you know, and that means because it's somebody who had money and collateral to be able to do that, because not everybody can just go to a bail bond agency and get bail posted for them. Um, you know, I, I I don't believe in, you know, really more incarceration, but to say that we have no other means of supervising folks is really not true because they're putting people on electronic home monitoring all the time. You know, um, they they do that all the time. I, it's not the best thing, but it, it's it's another tool that's available. Another thing is, is that there's court rule 3.2 that says they're supposed to be, judges are supposed to, you know, do the least restrictive means. And so if somebody is already poor and qualifying for a public defender, a thousand dollars bail doesn't seem like it's very the least restrictive. So there are tools that are already available to our courts and officers of the courts to use to reduce our jail population size. It's just a matter of whether they choose to use them or not. And again, like Sean said, what we're doing makes no sense. If somebody has a criminal conviction and they're criminalized for being homeless, then they get another criminal, they get a criminal conviction. The first thing that's going to get you denied from your rental application is your criminal conviction. So if y'all want people to not be homeless, but then you're going to criminalize the homeless and then you won't do any type of like, you know, our, our legislature won't do any rental protections for folks. We are just in a circle. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And, but we all know that, you know, if you invest in education, there's a better return on your investment there. If people have support services, you know, people that are, you know, retail theft or, you know, theft, are they stealing toiletries? Are they stealing toothpaste, deodorant, you know, body wash? Let's figure out why that person was still, what were, why were they stealing that? Obviously they don't have that, you know, and it's, it's really sad that, you know, our prosecutor's office chooses to focus on that when millions of dollars in wages are stolen every day by employers. We don't hear about those cases. So to focus on the most, you know, people, the people who have the least, it's it's really not making us safe. And then, you know, I think also there's this, this misconception that, you know, crime is on the rise. No, poverty is more in your face. And that is the issue. People are seeing poverty more and it's making them feel like crime is up. And, and that's the way we're going at it. And that's not going to fix it, nor is it sustainable because it's a waste of our tax dollars. We cannot keep doing this. It costs a lot of money to, to keep people in that place. Thank you, Chanel. That was a lot of really great information um, that I think a lot of people don't really think about, right? Um, as far as you know, people stealing to just get by and now their life is, you know, completely destroyed um, because they don't have resources. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Anita, you had uh, your hand up. I did briefly. I just, um, Chanel said so many brilliant things there. Uh, and I was, uh, I had a thought about one of the earlier things, which was and relatively sort of less important to compare to all the things that she just um, brought out. But in thinking about what the impact is of people being on jail, I also just wanted to add in one like very sort of, um, I guess, procedural thing, which is right now, and I think so, I see someone has dropped into the chat, um, the Seattle Times article about conditions in the jail. Right now, it is incredibly hard for people who are incarcerated in the jail to get good access to their attorneys. So it's really hard for them to fight their cases because of staffing, because of COVID, because whatever else is happening, our attorneys are finding themselves in many, many instances waiting, you know, sometimes an hour, sometimes longer to try to see a client. I, um, the other day I was in the jail trying to see someone, you know, for this calendar that I was talking about. And I went to the eighth floor, all the boots were filled. There were four public defenders sitting on the floor. I, I didn't see the person I needed to see because that's how crowded the jail is. And so one of the other impacts of being incarcerated, at least right now, is that it is very hard to actually connect with your lawyer and figure out how to fight your case. And I think this is something that um, that we should, everyone should be caring about, not just public defenders, not just community, but the prosecutor and, uh, and the courts. When you're making a decision about whether someone should be in jail, and again, as a public defender, right, my position is no one should be. But if you're part of one of the institutions that 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 engages in incarceration, 
you should have in your head, what are the conditions of confinement in which this person is going to be caged? And is it really, is this case really one in which I want to put that person in that situation? Instead of just saying, oh, that's the jail's problem, that's the jail staffing issue, whatever, the entire criminal punishment system, criminal legal system, it is an ecosystem of which, you know, public defense is both, you know, we're both part of it and we're also critics of it, but it is all part of one thing. And we all have to be looking at, at how the other pieces of it are working. Um, but anyway, so I just wanted to add in that small piece right now that the current situation is that our attorneys are having, you know, a, the, our clients who are sitting in jail are having a very hard time connecting with their attorneys because of, of, of the challenges that the jail is facing. Awesome. Thank you um, for that additional information. Um, I kind of want to go on to uh, plea bargaining and uh, get a little information from you, Dan, um, about your um, thoughts on plea bargaining. Well, as Anitha said, that's how most cases resolve, but it does obviously require both sides to have to get to get to know the case, to have the discovery and to, to understand it. So that's an important part. In, in my office, we do what I've called a conservative filing. Which we'll file a count or two that we think reflects the, the, the conduct. And if the person doesn't take that offer, then we are we feel we are free to add additional counts if we go to trial. Now, many other offices add, they charge everything they can think of up front and then dismiss them all for a plea. And I, a lot of defense attorneys prefer that process just because of that gives, allows them to tell their client, hey, I got them to dismiss nine out of the 10 counts. We would rather file the one count that we think is reflects the conduct rather than file 10 and dismiss nine. But it's just a different approach. Different offices do it in a different way. Is it coercive? Certainly. I mean, there's, and there, there is, uh, especially if you're in custody, I, I, and I've seen the credit for time served calendars in municipal courts. Uh, when I'm talking about bail and the things that we're talking about today, I'm thinking about the 230 people who are charged with, with murder in King County and are waiting for trial. Uh, you know, those are the folks where we uh, argue hardest for bail. So when someone's taken a life and they're, fa they're facing decades in prison, do we really think they're going to come back uh, voluntarily to court? It's, it's not. So most of those cases, that's where we fight the bail is a, is a serious violent case, not in a shoplifting case, which we lar largely don't even prosecute anymore. But plea negotiations are uh, two attorneys who are uh, familiar with the facts and they are predicting what they think a reasonable judge or jury would do with a certain case. And because of the way that the determinant sentencing scheme is in the state of Washington, we can adjust charges and we can enhance this. We can basically tailor the, the discretion that the judge will have in giving the uh, ultimate sentence. So it's a, again, when the a plea is entered, it's just not binding on the judge. It's an agreement by the defense and the prosecution to recommend to the judge a certain outcome, but the judge can do anything above or below that range. Uh, so it's, it's, but it really does require all attorney offices to be adequately staffed and for uh, the, the proper access to clients to be had so that these are informed decisions because they're obviously very important decisions. Thank you, Dan. Um, and Sean, it looks like you have um, something to say as well. Yeah, I have an opinion about most things in life, and I have one about this too. Um, you know, one of the when, before I had the the opportunity to serve our community in this way, I was in sales. Um, and when I when I was in sales, what I was really good at was like these add on sales, right? So you would like buy something and then you like want to accessorize the thing. And I was like really good at getting people to accessorize by helping them understand how much better the thing would be if they added all these additional accessories. Um, there was also this tactic that we regularly use, right? Which was like, look, this thing's on sale right now. And if you buy this thing on sale today, this is the best deal that you're ever going to get. Um, and, and often for people who wanted to make sure they were getting the best deal, they would lean into that and say, absolutely, right? But you know, one of the, one of the, the things that other people would do is say like, look, if you want this deal, um, if you wanna be able to have me be the person who's making this purchase, like if I come back next week, you're gonna offer me the same thing, which in earnest was more often true than not because we wanted to be able to move the products that were in our store, right? Um, 
when did we begin to consider the people who were living incarcerated as products that we needed to move off a shelf? Oh, that sounds like slavery. Um, that sounds like slavery manifesting in the prison industrial complex. Oh, oh, we're like monetizing people in a way that like we get to determine how quickly we can push them off the shelf based upon the type of deal that they're willing to take to move themselves forward. This is deeply problematic and harmful. If some, if, if a prosecutor's office, this is one of the things that just boggles my mind, just from a shared, like a, a humanity, many of the things, but from a simple place of like shared humanity, if you're willing to offer a plea on Monday and then you go to trial and that plea is no longer accessible, then what you're telling me is on Monday, this person was less of a threat to community. But now that they've gone to trial, they're a greater threat to community. And so we need to increase the charges that they're taking on because they didn't take the deal in the first place because they believe that there would be due process and that through that due process that they would be decriminalized for the behavior that was initially criminalized in the first place. And, and, and that's just like from a base level, it seems logical to me that if you were offered this in the beginning, that you'd be also offered this at the end. If we were centering you as a humanity and not as some sort of like monetized figure that's helping continually justify the resourcing of an overly funded criminal legal system that is underemployed, which is at this moment causing terrific harm to those who are being put on the shelf and not being able to be moved through market. Um, I, I hope that that analogy worked for many people to understand the parallels between what we're doing today and what we've done historically in enslaving bodies in our country, in addition to pointing out some of the ridiculous notions around pleas versus actual criminal charges when we're talking about the theater of the criminal legal system in and of itself. This whole performative justice doesn't actually honor the humanity of those who are the main protagonist in the narrative. How do we get back to centering the person who was the, the people who were harmed <laughs> and the people who were accused of causing harm in a way where our question isn't what is uh, the right sentence to give, but our question is what is the quickest way to get them access to healing so that way this harm stops from occurring? Um, I, I, I need to like, make it make sense. Yes, Anita. And then I have another question right after this question, because we're going to have to answer it briefly, because I want to go ahead uh, and get to the questions uh, from the audience as well. Um, Anita? I just, I, I mean, Sean is, uh, you know, captures so much so brilliantly and I <laughs> just so appreciate it. And I think, um, you know, to to put it sort of just in in, in like the, the terms of, of the world in which I live, right? Like, Basically, plea bargaining is often just prioritizing the efficiency of the system over the, ex over the exercise of rights that are guaranteed constitutionally to our clients, right? That people have a right to test the system. But instead, we have a system where, you know, if you say you're going to go to trial, you're threatened with those additional charges or with a longer sentence. Um, you know, a while ago, a colleague of mine had a case, a, a, young, a young person, where the prosecutor said, I want you to go in agreeing with me to a certain sentence, if you go in non-agreed, I'm going to ask for more time than, than if you agree with me. And it's like, you know, just as Sean said, what, is, is he more dangerous because he's not agreeing with your sentencing recommendation, right? Pro like the, the recommendation of the prosecutor, which carries huge weight with the court, should not be something that is tied to whether someone exercised any of, any of their rights, whether um, they challenge the state's evidence. It shouldn't be tied to any of that, right? It should be tied to I mean, the prosecutor's recommendation should be tied to what they believe is the appropriate outcome in the case, and and that appropriate outcome, their the the idea, their belief in what that outcome is sh should not change based on whether we choose to try to suppress evidence because we think an officer illegally searched our client, or whether we want to have a hearing to try to to to, to challenge the state's case. Right? We shouldn't penalize the exercise of these rights by saying, well, if you do that. I, you know, you're gonna, you're, you're wasting resources. You're costing the, the the system more money, and we're, you know, we're gonna really throw the book at you and and ask for a longer sentence or or whatever it is, um, right? The the exercise of rights, and again, like we should not forget who we're talking about. The exercise of rights by predominantly poor people and disproportionately BIPOC people is something that we should not be penalizing um, it, by prioritizing system efficiency, and that's how our system works right now. Thank you, uh, 
Uh, Dan, would you um, like to respond to that? Well, I would just say that, yes, there is something called a trial tax. If you go to trial, you're going to face more time. And it's in every single uh, one of the criminal justice systems in the United States because there has to be some way to disincentivize uh, the right to trial. And that sounds terrible to say, but we in King County, for instance, can do about 100 jury trials a year now given COVID. We have to use three courtrooms. We don't jam everybody in a small uh, jury room anymore. So maybe we can do 100 jury trials, but we filed 6,000 felony cases. If everybody wants a trial, you can do the math. It, it's going to take, it's just not possible. So in every system, not just ours, but every system in America has a, an early out. If you take early responsibility for the thing that you did, you get a better deal than if you fight tooth and nail and put the state to its test and bring in witnesses and go through all that, the process of, of trial, uh, it's likely that you would, in any jurisdiction, you will face additional uh, penalties for that. And you may not like it, but it's the truth. Uh, and it's the only way that we can resolve that many cases. If, if all the defendants stood in as a union, of one and said, no, we all want a trial, uh, it would break the system down and it would be really hard to, to accomplish uh, that many trials in even several years, uh, you know, 6,000 trials at 100 trials a year, you can do the math, I can't, but it's, 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 so it's how the systems all over the United States and probably all over the world manage and you might not like it. I think that there's some things you can do to be more transparent about the size of the trials, trial tax. I think that the judge who sentences should know what the uh, what the parties contemplated or what the offers were made up to that point. But uh, right now, that is the reality, and I don't I don't see an easy way out uh, of of that. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, and then uh, briefly, Chanel, um, you had a comment. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Satterberg, for, for saying that, because I have been saying for a long time, the best thing to do is to bankrupt the system and everybody take their case to trial. And thank you for actually giving us a number. So that being said, y'all heard 100 cases would bankrupt Seattle Superior Court, or excuse me, King County Superior Court. So we need about at least 100 plus folks to take everything to trial. Um, I, I too, you know, just, I, I think what needs to be, said is that the fact that Mr. Satterberg just admitted that right here to all of us, this is what they're doing. So this is what they're doing. They're using this to play with people's lives. Ultimately, that's what we're doing. When you're, when you're telling somebody that, well, if you take this deal, I'll do this. And yes, we all understand their sentencing guidelines. And, and yes, if you go to trial, because the, you know, maximum, you know, you could potentially get the maximum, but it still doesn't address the fact that they're being offered a significantly less time at a charge, and then they're deciding to exercise the right to go somewhere. So I, I just think it needs to be known that and, and acknowledged that this is what is happening. And while yes, it's not, you know, Mr. Satterberg in every single courtroom, there are other folks who are prosecutors who are working for him who are not, you know, doing the right thing or moving ethically about in the courtroom. So, and he can only speak to himself, but, you know, on a, on a day to day in the real lives, like that's, it's not all like this great and what's happening. And, and Anita just clearly explained a, a couple of examples. So I just wanted that to be noted. Thank you, Chanel, so much. Um, so that leads to the very last question. And then we have to hop on over um, to the audience questions. But um, how do you respond to community concerns that uh, restorative justice, which we kind of talked about, um, is letting criminals go free? Um, what do you what do you say to that, especially after this, you know, tax statement, right? Um, Sean, would you like to answer that? Absolutely. Um, first of all, if somebody hasn't been given due process um, and have had the opportunity to have the facts of the case considered, um, they're not actually a criminal. They're someone whose behavior has been criminalized. So let's just let's like start there from a legal standpoint. Um, from a human standpoint, um, 
people aren't criminals. <laughs> there are people who have caused harm and have had that harm adjudicated and as a result, it had some sort of sentence given them based upon the harm that they've caused and our, the way that our system of justice functions. But people are not criminals. People are humans. Um, people are flesh and blood. People are fallible. People are lots of things, but we are not criminals. Um, they, so I just want to like ground us in that narrative itself being harmful. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is this, is that like so often we do the comparative contrast to a baseline that's non-existent. Um, if we say that, you know, restorative practices let people who are criminals go free without like a heavy slap. And, and as a result, we had this conviction that they're more likely to do something that cause harm in the future. Like, where's the data set to affirm that that's beyond our feelings and our emotions? Like, I get like the feeling and the emotion, right? I understand that the insecurity because what it is that we've been indoctrinated with as a country um, we have been sold a, a bad bill of goods that there is a system in place that's going to keep all of us safe and secure. And who that system really protects is the upper middle class and the affluent and not those who have been furthest away from justice since the inception of our country. And so I'm not going to give us a long winded history lesson to how we get to this place of even assuming that a restorative way of being could potentially create the space for people to cause more harm. But what I will say is this, um, our organization has proven something to be true beyond uh, a shadow of a doubt in my estimation, that the work that we've done in partnership with other community-based organizations like uh, Creative Justice, Collective Justice, Freedom Project, there's project, there's project, you know, there's, there's all these, all, all of these other organizations that are doing great work in community to, to say that if given the same runway and the opportunity over a prolonged period of time to assemble a data set to affirm what it is we know to be true, we have a deep conviction that unequivocally it will be more prosperous for our community at large, for people to not experience the exasperate uh, impacts of the court system and get more access to community and healing right off the bat. When our work is largely focused on young people whose behavior has been criminalized as misdemeanors, and when I say young people, I mean those 12 to 24, and that over 90% of those that have had the access to our services aren't returning to the criminal legal system within 12 months of engaging in our program, what that tells me is that a couple of things. Number one, that many of these folks simply needed to be seen as possible and not problematic. And and too often in our criminal legal system, when behavior has been criminalized, as the question was phrased, they're now deemed criminal and they're no longer seen as possible and what they can be, but they're limited to the lens of what it is that they may or may not have done. Also, people need a community of support. They need to be able to go home, be home, be in community, surrounded by a group of people who are affirming them as that possibility and resourcing them to develop and cultivate the skill sets within themselves to allow them to thrive in the neighborhoods that they desire to live in. Thirdly, we need to make sure that we're not addressing individuals who are causing harm as an individual concern. Uh, we need to understand that these individuals are coming from communities, that they're coming from families that are likely suffering from the same conditions that led to the manifestation of their behavior in a way that may have caused harm. So if what we do as a system to repair harm is take an individual who's isolating, isolate the individual who has manifested harm in a way that's been deeply problematic, and assume by isolating this individual and removing them from the community that we're somehow going to help that community that they were removed from thrive in a way that wouldn't produce people in the future who are suffering from similar harms because we haven't begun to meet the material needs, then we're intentionally walking in a circle saying what we need to do is be tougher on crime while we're simultaneously saying we need to we need to limit wages and we simultaneously need to say that, that, that there's certain people who haven't worked hard enough to deserve a living wage. You know, it, it, the, I'll say this and then I'll step back because there's so much more. I, I told y'all I took a nap before this so I could be on this thing at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. You know, if people had a, a universal right to housing, health care and a basic income, we could end this whole conversation right now that we would have a small percentage of people who would likely still cause some level of harm because mental health is real and addiction is real. But if we wanted to make sure that there weren't 6,000 cases that had to get plead to an effort for the 100 to be seen, housing, healthcare, and a basic income, 
we can leverage all those additional resources that are being put into place in order to be able to do the performative acts of prosecution and the public defense and the theater of the court system. If we quit showing up to the, 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 the theater who runs the longest running gig longer than than Wicked on, on Broadway, it really is the criminal legal system, the greatest theater on earth. If we stopped resourcing it in that way and we made sure people had access to housing, health care and a basic income, we wouldn't be having the conversation we're having right now. And the court and the prosecution and public defense and, and police in, it could, could really leverage whatever fundamental benefits still exist beyond that to engage people who are truly suffering because of something going on within themselves that can't be met by housing, health care, and a basic income and make sure they get access to healing in a safe way that, that limits the impact on the community at large. Like that's Absolutely. the world that I imagine, that's the world I live in. And I believe mm -hmm. that restorative practices are the pathway to get us there, but we need to mm -hmm. broaden the path and allow the runway to exist that's on par with the hundreds of years that we've been criminalizing behavior in this country. Yes, <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, so we're gonna go right on over to the audience questions now. Um, we have a question um, from, Let's see, Kristen, it's how much does the prosecutor take into account uh, what the impacted families want in terms of prosecuting or not? And if they want restorative justice rather than punitive? Um, I'm going to throw that question on over to Dan. Well, it matters a lot what the survivors, and let's, let's pick our right, let's say there's a homicide. That's what I think about when I think about the serious work that we do. If, if, if a, the surviving offer to pay them the restitution. It looks like we lost Dan. Dan is back. Well, something happened. Sorry, Let's I got see, kicked can off. Can you all hear me? Anyway, it matters what Let's people see. think. Uh, it looks like we're having some connection issues right now. Um, let's see can here. Can you hear me? Am I, am I audible? Hello, testing one, two, three. Sorry, yeah. I don't know what we okay. can hear you. We can. All right. Okay. So yeah. And the story is about um so we are going to uh move on. Um I'm glad y'all can still hear me um because I can't see you. <laughs> um so let's see, let's move forward um on the next uh question here. Um we did have a question uh that came up regarding, um, let's see here. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see, does the screening uh, process to screen demographic data out of police reports also screen out if the offender is a police officer? How is the bias being set aside when deciding to prosecute police officers? So I, I mentioned that there are some experiments going on with, with different tools to remove the identification. I don't know. There's, there's, a, there's not a standard one, and I don't know that they've, they've reached any sort of uh, conclusion. I just know that there are people who are the offices that are Can trying to hide that information. Yeah, we can hear we can hear Dan and um, Anita's back. So just keep going. Dan, were you, were you done with your answer? I'm all done. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> not a problem. Yeah, it says that it's uh, not responding. So I can't see or I can hear y'all, but I can't see. Felicia, Felicia, if I may, just quickly to that question. It looks like we may have lost yes. Felicia. No, please go, Sean. Yeah, yeah it looks ahead. like there's a system-wide yeah. issue with yeah. Zoom. So please please continue yes it's all good it's all it's all good we we you know what like you know as felicia gets back and we can moderate the situation together this is uh yeah. 
this is 2022. We like, we got this at this we point. Got this. Here, you know, um, you know, one of the, one of the things I just wanted to share is that like, I'm removing bias from the criminal legal system. Like I, can I confession, like I love to run, but I also really enjoy baked goods and I love an ice cream sandwich. And I've been looking for how I can remove the negative calories out of baked goods and those ice cream sandwiches, those Trader Joe's ice cream sandwiches in particular, those are like, they're good. They're really good, good, good. But you know what I can't do? I can't remove the bad calories and the bad fats and the bad sugars out of it because they're baked into the situation, right? And so that's kind of what it's like to remove bias from the criminal legal system. It's like removing the calories out. If you just, if you don't want the bad calories, what my dietitian would say, you just got to stop eating those foods, which is hard for me to do because I love a good cookie, especially from Treat Cookie and Burian. Shout out to them. But the point being is you just got to stop consuming the thing that's causing harm if you want the harm to stop happening. And so if we want to remove the bias from these processes, we have to stop consuming these processes and assuming that somehow they're going to produce outcomes that are absent of bias. Yeah, does anyone else want to respond to that question? Or do we have a next one up that we could pop into the chat room? I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. Okay, so I guess we covered one of the questions that we had asked um, was, what's the benefit to a prosecutor to getting people to accept plea bargains? And Dan, you kind of covered this, just, you know, it's necessary for the system to keep functioning. Um, so I feel like we covered that. Um, and, you know, and Sean just touched on that again. So, um, you know, I guess somebody's asking kind of what are the ethical um, considerations that go into like how you formulate a plea, what kind of um, what kind of offers extended and that sort of thing. Is there like a set of criteria that the office abides by or is it just sort of left to the individual discretion of each prosecutor? Dan, do you wanna try to tackle that? Well, again, in the serious violent cases that my office is dealing with primarily right now, that there's usually more than one prosecutor involved in making that offer. It's obviously based on what we think we can prove, the evidence that we have, and we have to disclose all of the evidence that we have and the weaknesses in our case as well. So that's where the ethical uh, wraparound is, is that, you know, we're dealing with facts that we think we can prove. And if we can prove them, then it would, it would satisfy the elements of this particular crime. I see Anita is, is hiring anybody who walks in the door and we're, we're in a hiring crunch too. Good to have help. Uh, but I bet you have a, she may have a different view of that. But anyway, yeah, the, the ethical constraints are really, you, you can't plea bargain on a case that you can't prove. And if the person didn't do it, you shouldn't be there. And, and nobody wants to be in that position uh, either. Awesome, Felicia, are you ready to take the reins again? Yes, I'm back. That, okay. was, a, that was a good time. <laughs> All right, cool. I'm going to just kick me right on out. Um, okay, so we're going to go on to our next uh, question. I don't know um, if it was answered or heard or not, um, but when someone is is held for three days without knowledge of mental health issues. How does the person get his, her, their needs met without a backslide in mental health stability? Is it all right, um, if, I speak, is it all right if I try to speak to that? And then I don't know absolutely. if you know, but I, I, I've been summoned for bedtime. So I will um, <laughs> answer this question and then um, get to story reading. Um, I mean, the short answer is, they're going to backslide. It is very hard for, I mean, even in the, I, I mean, it's hard to talk about even what in the best of times at the jail, you know, where they're adequately staffed and there's jail help and whatever. And, and again, like Chanel's description of what it's like to be in jail, like rings in my ears, right? It's dirty, it's dark, it's terrible. So like, um, but right now it's, it's far from the best of times and people are having a hard time getting their meds. And particularly if you're, if, if you are one of those people who's booked in and then released relatively quickly, the right there, there's really no ability to, to, to verify that you have a prescription to get you the meds and, 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 and to stabilize you. And so all we're doing there is destabilizing people. And yes, people go in and they backslide and then they get released and they come out less safe 
as we all do, right? When someone's life has been destabilized after spending three days in custody without access to what they need and they get out and 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 they're worse off and have a hard time, right? Sort of meeting their own needs because they've been so destabilized. So um, sorry, that was a lot of words just to say they're worse off than when they went in. And as a result, we all are because we are all living in this community together. Um, I was trying to say- there was another question before you take off and then okay. Sean, I'll get to you, uh, bounce back over to you. But um, it was, what is the dashboard uh, that you referenced earlier related to bail slash custody status and how do people find that? Um, you know, I am just going to drop it into the chat. Uh, so this is the jail's dashboard about who's in um, and it's got a ton of interesting information. So right now it says, for length of stay, 50% of the people there are for are there for zero to three days, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, but so dropping it into the chat, I hope this works. Um, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just, uh, before, before I need the drops, I just, I wanna, there's two things I wanna call out. Number one, like, <laughs> Growing up in a household myself with two parents that suffered from their own mental health concerns and challenges, this notion of like backsliding um, in the best of conditions and the worst con conditions in any conditions, like that's just part of the healing journey, right? That's part of getting to a whole place mentally, recovering from addiction, right? We can label it whatever we want, but in the best of circumstances, that's the reason why people invest so much money in therapy is because it's really hard to do this thing called living in this world, right? and do it in a way where we're focused on wellness. So if in the best of conditions, for those that are listening and tapping in, I just, I think it's important that we don't like compartmentalize people who are being criminalized because of their mental health and their, 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 their addiction concerns and their journey that they're on in life and the variety of other factors, that we compartmentalize them as different or other than everybody else in our community that's suffering from similar things. The difference is the access to privilege that the folks who are in other contexts are suffering in that gives them liberty to tap into other resources that keep them from being criminalized when they're in the midst of crisis. Um, but all of us, particularly coming out of this pandemic, there is a mental health crisis throughout our country because of all of what it is that we've endured. So this isn't like, so when you ask questions like, what happens for somebody who's incarcerated? What happens to somebody who's not incarcerated? What's happening with y'all right now? How are you dealing with what you're dealing with? What resources are you implementing to get through what you're getting through? Now imagine that you don't have those resources. How are you doing? How are you doing, right? Like, I think that's important that like we make sure that we marry our humanity together in a way that doesn't create an other because by virtue of creating the other, we become the other and, and end up instituting the very tools of oppression for our own liberation. And we gotta get better as a collective us and make sure that we're enveloping all of us within that collective. And Anita, Absolutely. I have to call out because your child just popped up over your shoulder that it's important that folks are listening and watching as well, understand that the collateral mm -hmm. impact for those of us that are serving in these spaces goes far beyond like the nine to five hours. As I mentioned, when I let in, I'm on this because of how significant this particular race is and how important it is that people in our community are making informed decisions. And it's obvious that, that my sibling Anita is doing the exact same thing, the same thing with Chanel and, and, and Dan, after all these 30 some odd years of service, similarly understands the weight of what's in front of us. I am gonna community, throw out there we, really we, quick. We, let, please just, real quick, real quick. Let me just Absolutely. close this community. Before Anita drops, we have to make sure that we take this particular ballot decision to heart and make sure that your community votes, votes for what's possible, votes for where it is we want to be, and does not make a voting decision to go back to where it is we already came from. There was nothing there that we can benefit from. Everything we can benefit from lives in a future that's not antiquated like law and order. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sean. So much great information. I know there are several uh, questions in the comments that we weren't able to get to, um, but we will definitely um, be able to answer some of those questions later through email or whatnot. Um, and uh, there was one thing though that I would like you to briefly speak on. We have about one minute, um, but people are saying, you know, what about, um, you know, this, this beautiful world, the picture perfect world that you're painting, Sean, with, um, you know, restorative justice and, and, you know, oh, what about people who are committing, you know, crimes like murder and so forth. And they're, you know, 
shouldn't, why, why shouldn't we lock them up? Um, why, you know, this all just sounds so beautiful, but you know, what about, what about that? Yeah, Felicia, and I'll be succinct. I know that's challenging for me, um, but I'll be as succinct as I possibly can be and not wake up everybody else that's in this hotel. I just realized that it's 1130 and I'm speaking at a volume that may be disrupting others. Um, look, so here's the thing. Most people will never be impacted by murder in their life. Like most people will never be impacted directly by the criminal legal system in their life. Most people will never have to activate 911 as a result of harm happening to themselves in their life. In fact, what we're talking about is how do we create that environment where those other people live for the people who are those that are most frequently accessing this system that's perpetuated harm. That's why, although we can feel utopian, what we're really talking about is how do we make sure material conditions are met, which then changes the conversation about how people get the support they need so they're no longer struggling with the types of things that produce the kind of harm that, 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 that Dan talks about, which is the minority, which are these really egregious things that, 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 that scare us and have us recoiling back in consideration of like the worst case possible that could ever happen in the in the history of ever. This utopian society isn't as distant as we'd like it to be. When there's people in our country that make a jabillion dollars a year who go to offices that are on the very same block with those that are in the midst of a mental health crisis and can't get their support they need because our state has a tax policy that doesn't bring resources in to meet those basic needs, this isn't an imaginary land that I'd love to live in. It's a very probable place that we can exist in together. But what it requires is two things. For us to see our shared humanity so we're no longer looking at folks who are sleeping on sidewalks and saying, I'm glad that's not me, but we're saying that's my sibling. And two, that with that revelation that we are who we are collectively, that we make sure people have access to housing, healthcare, and a basic income. If we can do that as a collective, this conversation evolves and it changes. That's not utopia. It's only utopia for those who are afraid to let go of the resources they have at, at, the, at the most exuberant in effort for all of us to thrive together. Thank you so much. Um, so I can give about, I'm so sorry to cut this off. I can give about 30 seconds, Chanel, and then we do have I, to say good night. I'm quickly in the chat. There's somebody in the chat that's asking about what about businesses and why is Dan not prosecuting shoplifting and they were speaking they recently in a westwood village and the staff watched somebody load their backpack and walk out they could not interfere this is hurting our community as well as it become rampant lawlessness is not the answer in my opinion so businesses have insurance they have insurance for for loss and for theft um two you know i think it's partly like these anecdotal stories like these which makes us somebody stealing from a store is not really lawlessness it's just order like it's something you just don't like that's that's not really harming you it's harming the business but is it I mean they have insurance so I think we have to get out of this notion of like you know everything is it's lawless but it's also like well they couldn't afford it most people are not out there just stealing for the heck of it they're stealing for needs people are hurting our wages have not gone up in 40 years the cost of living is rising so people are hurting COVID like people, we we acted like COVID is no longer existent and everything is just back to normal. That's not the case for a lot of folks. People that were on the edge and the brink of barely making it prior to COVID have now fallen off that cliff. So, you know, I, I really just, these, these stories about, well, what about the businesses? What about the people? What about the community? What about your your neighbors that, that need something. And two, I wouldn't expect employees to go after somebody. You never know what could be going on. People should not have to risk their life to, you know, for a corporation, for some store. That's what insurance is for. That's what loss is. That's, you know, whatever they're doing, that's an investment. There's a risk with an investment. Sometimes people mm -hmm. steal, but really mm -hmm. why are they stealing? I, so mm -hmm. I, I, and I'm sorry that those, those types of questions is in, and stories is why we got into this place because two folks have been living off of 30 years of law and order and thinking that's the way the criminal justice system works and it doesn't and and you're really all you're doing is harming folks so what they stole something that that's not our bigger issues have them start prosecuting you know or you know going after investigating you know all the rapes you know child abductions murders but the the theft that's what we're worried about 
we don't even have an income tax here. We got what? We got a Gates, a Balmer, yeah. Allen, a Schultz, all these people, and they're mm-hmm. not paying their fair share, but we're worried about the people who are stealing from the businesses who can barely get by. Absolutely. That's, that's not a big thing to be worried about. Thank you so much, Chanel, um, for your response. So we have a ton of questions pouring in, and I want to get to all of them, but unfortunately, we are out of time. We are five minutes um, after (laughs) the time uh, that we were supposed to stop at. So, um, you know, definitely lots of um, great points uh, were mentioned. Um, There will be links provided to people um, so they can get some further data and information. Um, I highly suggest people look up, um, you know, some of these topics, look up, uh, you know, the restorative justice projects uh, that are out there and uh, the different organizations that have been um, represented here as well. So I'm gonna kick it right on over to you, Heather, um, to say goodnight. Okay, thank you all for bearing with us a few extra minutes. Um, Super appreciate our panelists being here. I know it was a lively discussion, um, ranging from shoplifting to ice cream sandwiches. Um, So I appreciate, you know, you all showing up to have like what is a real and difficult conversation about an imperfect and, you know, harmful system. Um, I know that we're working within constraints. So when we talk about what choices the prosecutor is making, you know, it's about all of us coming together to try to figure out like, what do we want as voters, right? How can we make this the overarching system work? Or do we need to just create a different uh, model um, that serves community and achieves safety in a different context, in a broader context? Um, So I really appreciate all of you um, showing up and kind of just, you know, diving right in, Um, you know, at the League of Women Voters, we do not, uh, we we do not stray from controversy. Uh, We we invite it, we welcome it, we try to create spaces where it can take place. Um, And to all those who pop questions into the chat, um, we will collect them and um, do our best to field them out to our panelists and get you answers. Um, so I posted some links in the chat for our, our uh, partnering, uh, presenting organizations, the federal way back, let me just try that all over again, you guys, it is a little late, Federal Way Black Collective, the Northwest Community Bail Fund, and the Puget Sound Passport Rotary Club. Thank you. Thank you for bringing support um, tonight and helping organize the event. Um, we appreciate you and we welcome future partnerships. Um, and of course, like none of this could happen without all of our supporters and funders. You know, we are grassroots organizations. We are working, <laughs> we are hustling. We are trying to make uh, great content for you. Also, if, if all of you uh, appreciated this, check your post-event email for ways to donate and support um, all four presenting organizations. Um, Anything else I'm forgetting, Felicia? Thank you. You were awesome. Thank I really so appreciate much. you uh, holding space for this and uh, you know kicking, kicking the questions around. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, Thank you so cool. much for having me. Everyone, have a wonderful night. Get out, get out and vote. Make <laughs> hey, a date yes. with your ballot. <laughs> can I just mention one of our presenters, um, the Metropolitan Urban League of Seattle, wanted to give it a shout out to them. Sorry, so. sorry, my bad. I just skipped right over y'all. But I really appreciate you. Thank you for coming. Uh, this will be on YouTube. Thank you, Sean. Oh my goodness, go to bed. Um. <laughs> right. Uh, all right. All right. I'm gonna sign Have off. a great night. Good night. Bye.